Hi, I'm Jim Mirage, and today we're going to visit John Beebe, a San Francisco Jungian analyst and an expert on Jung psychological types. Well, I'm John Beebe, and I'm a Jungian analyst in practice in San Francisco, where I've actually been in the practice of psychotherapy since 1971. Uh, in addition to my private practice, I do quite a bit of consultation and teaching, uh, much at the Jung Institute of San Francisco, where I received uh, my own training as a Jungian analyst. I've been an analyst since 1978. Um, I am the editor of two journals, the San Francisco Jung Institute Library Journal, and also the Journal of Analytical Psychology. I was very fortunate in my training as a Jungian analyst to get a lot of exposure to the theory of psychological types. Uh, first of all, the Jung Institute of San Francisco was founded by Joe Wheelwright, who with his wife Jane Wheelwright and Horace Gray created that test nowadays known as the Gray Wheelwright's test which is a rather simpler uh, paper and pencil type test than uh, the Myers-Briggs uh, type indicator and uh, was the local product of choice so that all of us uh, had exposure to it and uh, uh, usually uh, took the test. And uh, um, Joe Wheelwright himself was an absolutely marvelous teacher of psychological types. I still remember a talk he gave in uh, the uh, fall of 1971 about psychological types and it was so splendid. I still remember him. Uh, uh, he just created it out of whole cloth. It now exists. One can order it from the C.G. Young Institute of San Francisco. But uh, I recall him uh, uh, saying wonderful things. My favorite was a little poem that went, uh, E is for extrovert, fairest that lives, whom the introvert never forgets nor forgives. And uh, there were many, many lovely, uh, lovely uh, moments and times when he explained. He used to say things like, uh, uh, well, now, you all know about getting your feelings hurt, but uh, some of us who are heavy feeling types, well, we get our thinkings hurt. And he would just teach type in that marvelous uh, down-home way. He, told, he had a wonderful routine about how he... Uh, he was one like Joe Henderson, who had a Jungian analysis with Jung long before he had any professional sense of direction. They were just uh, duty uh, puerae eternae that had gone to Zurich because the wise old man was there and were living off either inherited money or on the bum uh, with uh, occasional uh, newspaper jobs and the like and had no real sense of direction and then they got into their analysis and then they got to saying, gee, this is so interesting, I'd like to be a Jungian analyst. And so Jung had to say, uh, look here, if you want to be serious about being a Jungian analyst, you're going to have to go to medical school and you're going to have to be a doctor and you're going to have to show some sense of responsibility before people can uh, respect you, let alone trust you with their psyche. So uh, Jung was able to uh, uh, cure both Joe Henderson and Joe Wheelwright of their uh, puer problems by getting them to go to London and uh, uh, train as doctors. So Joe Wheelwright tells very funny stories about his training, uh, I guess at Maudsley Hospital in London, where uh, he walked into a room and uh, on grounds and the chief physician said, what is that uh, patient uh, suffering from uh, uh, Wheelwright? And Wheelwright looked right back and said, oh, he has tuberculosis. And uh, the doctor was just furious. Well, as a matter of fact, he does have tuberculosis. But did you uh, put on your stethoscope? Did you listen to his lungs? Did you look at... Uh, his hands? Did you take his pulse? Did you look at his skin? No, you just stood across the room and said he has tuberculosis. And uh, Joe said that that's how intuition was uh, treated when he was uh, a medical student. So we, we just sort of learned this in the most down-home natural way. And so intuitive type, thinking type, feeling type, sensation type were 
absolute realities to all of us, and extrovert and introvert and so forth. And then we had uh, Wayne Detloff, who was the man who uh, first uh, uh, did the heretical thing of telling us that there was such a thing as a Myers-Briggs uh, type indicator. And uh, he was the one that told me something that uh, I gather still is heretical in some circles, but not in the circles I uh, travel in and create for myself that if the superior function is extroverted, then the auxiliary function is introverted, or if the superior function is introverted, the auxiliary is extroverted. And uh, I know that uh, uh, there are many people who uh, uh, still resist the idea, but I'm absolutely enamored of it, and I can usually prove how it's true of them, uh, even against their resistance. But in any case, for what, for what it's worth, it was Wayne Detloff who was the source of that idea in my experience. And, of course, there was Jane Wheelwright, who was very much an introverted sensation type, very uh, grounded in her own sense of reality, very clear about uh, who she was and uh, uh, what was true, and stayed always with facts in a wonderful kind of way. And then we had Elizabeth Osterman, who uh, just turned 80 in the last uh, year or so, and uh, Elizabeth uh, uh, was very strong on types. She was the one that made me realize uh, when I was doing some analytic work with her that um, if you're a man and your superior function is, as mine is, extroverted intuitive, the anima has a type too. And the anima, in, in my uh, case, is introverted sensation. Now, I remember when I said that to her, you know, I think my anima is introverted sensation, and I can still remember her saying, I couldn't agree more. And when your analyst says that to you, then you really remember it. So I didn't have to get it out of a book. I had it right from my, my analyst, that we had looked at the anima figure in my dream, and. Uh, she was an introverted sensation type, and she had her own reality, and it was different. In fact, the inverse of mine, she was just as uh, polar opposite to me as, as it was possible to be, or so I thought at that time. And so, uh, step by step, as I learned the ropes about what it was to uh, uh, be a person, and a doctor, and uh, uh, a Jungian uh, uh, therapist, I had this strong support in uh, talking about this typologically. I realize how lucky I am because if I trained almost anywhere else in the world as a Jungian analyst, there wouldn't have been anywhere near this discussion of types and there certainly wouldn't have been as much authority behind it. I mean, you always learn what your teachers think is important to learn. So I had a lot of early grounding in it. How many Jungian analysts actually use psychological types? There have been very few research studies on uh, the use of types by Jungian analysts. Uh, the impression I got long ago from both the Plout and the uh, Detloff Bradway studies uh, was that type is poorly understood and very much underutilized, even by well-trained practicing Jungian analysts. Well, the question comes up as to whether um, type ought to be used, as the majority of people use it, as, uh, as you put it in the title of, of one of your books, uh, Gemma, a tool for understanding human differences. Uh, as a way to understand interactions between people who are dissimilar, or whether typology can also be used as an intrapsychic tool to explain um, what are sometimes called internal object relations in depth, where different parts of the psyche of a given individual are relating to each other. You know, Jung's complex theory has it that all of us are made up of different individuals, uh, that we're all some kind of multiple personality, that uh, 
what separates us from a diagnosable multiple personality, most of us, and someone who really has a multiple personality, is a perhaps um, a greater ability to uh, keep the parts together with some kind of glue that, that gives the personality its integrity. But uh, uh, only that, we are nevertheless, despite the glue, a very obvious mosaic. And when they, if you look closely at someone, you can see the various blocks that make up uh, the uh, uh, mosaic work of, of the psyche. And of course, uh, the typological theory has it that there are eight basic blocks. Um, uh, and so we also, by definition, would have to have eight complexes uh, carrying uh, those, those uh, 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 types or blocks or associated with those types or blocks. So we have, all of us, eight basic intelligences that make up the totality of our uh, uh, potential for, uh, for conscious functioning. Uh, the system of psychological types is simply an archetypal model that organizes those uh, eight uh, uh, basic units into some kind of structure. Now, there's a lot of arguments about what that structure is, but there's no argument that there are these eight basic intelligences. Now, Jung said that we need a function to tell us what is, and that's sensation, and we need a function to give it a name, and that's thinking. We need a function to tell us what it's worth, and that's feeling. And we need a function to tell us what its possibilities are, where it's headed, and that's intuition. And he made it sound very simple. Actually, what's behind that is one of the most uh, amazing intuitions in the history of science, that someone would have intuited that there is this uh, apparently fourfold cognitive structure. Now, those of us who look very closely at type recognize that uh, it's not really fourfold, it's eightfold, because each of these basic uh, functions, and the functions are, again, sensation, thinking, feeling, and intuition, can be used, or as I like to say, uh, deployed in either an extroverted or an introverted way, so that for all practical purposes we have not just uh, sensation, thinking, feeling, and intuition, but introverted sensation and extroverted sensation, and introverted thinking and extroverted thinking, and introverted feeling and extroverted feeling and introverted intuition and extroverted intuition. Now a lot of people say, who says? Why couldn't there be 52 functions and why couldn't you make up another set of pretty names and so forth? Well, uh, aside from the fact that Jung says, um, a lot of us who look very closely at how people sort out their adapting find that this sorting system Jung gave us is a remarkably complete description of how people actually uh, go about their functioning. Human consciousness does distribute itself in an individual in typical ways and that Jung has given us an extremely powerful archetypal model for understanding the distribution of intelligence in the, in the individual. Another way of saying it is the distribution of consciousness, or at least the potential for consciousness in an individual. Late in life, someone asked Jung, well, does consciousness help in the process of individuation? Uh, this person was thinking individuation meant some kind of self-actualization and maybe you could get there without uh, psychotherapy, but it might be so much better 
to have psychotherapy. So does consciousness help in the process of indi individuation? And Jung's answer was just sublime. He said, uh, consciousness is the human being's individuation. And then in the typical language of Jung, he said, you know, if a plant has it in its rhizome to produce a certain flower, and the plant goes on to flower, then you can speak of the flowering of the plant as the individuation of the plant. Then Jung said, consciousness is the human being's flower. And what I like to say is that if the human being flowers, if the human being gets consciousness, uh, sensation, thinking, feeling, and intuition are the petals of that flower. What, what operated in that fourfold way was a chance to uh, tap in to his unconscious wisdom about the psyche. And I think in that manner, via a perception through the unconscious, using his introverted intuition through an archetypal fourfold model, Jung found out more than a human being really has a right to know. He, he actually uh, uh, cracked a little bit of the code that time, I think, and got hold of the, of the theory of psychological types. Now we know that it's really an eight-fold flower, not a four-fold flower, and that we really have to think of these eight functions as eight quite separate things. Because, uh, sure, there's sensation, but there's introverted sensation and extroverted sensation. And if you hang around the type game long enough, you know that introverted sensation and extroverted sensation are so different that they might as well be called by entirely different names. Uh, they both employ sensory faculties, yes, but, and they both concern themselves with the nature of reality in a strong way. Uh, but, that, but there the uh, resemblance ends. The uh, introverted sensation uh, uh, type is extremely austere, and the extroverted sensation type is extremely lavish. Uh, how are types actually used in practice? For example, if someone comes to you for analysis, how does that person become aware of their own type? Well, there are two schools of thought. Uh, there's, the way, there's the way I was raised, and there's the way I raise others. Now, I had the kind of analyst at the beginning who didn't throw out facts and uh, well, not facts, I'm saying it wrong, who didn't throw out uh, terminology and theory, but let me find my own way. And I'll always admire that analyst, although I don't think uh, I'm capable of being quite that uh, open-ended and withholding. Uh, I uh, well remember uh, coming in uh, with a depression uh, and... Uh, talking about my low energy and my blocked feeling in life and uh, my analyst saying only after three or four sessions of just hearing me out in the most gentle way, do you ever dream when you're depressed? I suppose that's no big deal of a question uh, for a Jungian analyst to ask a patient. But it was so remarkable. I mean, it just was the day the light went on for me because his saying, do you ever dream when you're depressed, just lit me up. I mean, I, I just suddenly felt seen. I mean, it was as if a light went on in my room. Uh, for I had always dreamed. But no one had ever accorded me that kind of value. It had never, and particularly practical value. I mean, the implication was that the dreams would shed light on the depression or might have a role in getting me out of it or 
that my energy was somewhere, that I wasn't just depressed, but that something else was going on. And, that, and somehow that was everything I needed. I suddenly realized everything else. I mean, I realized that, well, of course, I, my mind was on my dreams. No wonder I couldn't pay attention to things, and no wonder I lost things, and I couldn't keep track of everyday things. I mean, it just became obvious to me that what I had always been so ashamed of, my inability to keep my eye on the ball, and, uh, uh, be a good athlete, or keep a neat room, or uh, uh, remember to have change for bus fare when I got on the bus, or whatever it might have been, or learn to drive a car, for goodness sake. I mean, all of it. All the things I found so hard to do were the flip side of where, of, of course, I'm dreaming. Of, I couldn't possibly be asked to do that. I'm a dreamer. I mean, he just sort of made that available to me by asking that question. And so without the names, I knew I was an intuitive type, and I knew I had inferior sensation, and that I was right side up. Instead of feeling inferior about my intuition, and even more inferior about my sensation. I mean, I felt good about myself for the first time. I think anyone who's used the type theory to rescue themselves understands this kind of experience. But he didn't do it through names, and I suppose that is really the best way to do it. But I'm an extroverted uh, therapist, and uh, I'm an extroverted, intuitive thinking type, and. Uh, I really get interested in the uh, uh, therapeutic process, and I have to admit I can't stay out of it. So as I'm sitting there r relating to the patient, I almost have to say what I see and think. And I'm never, I'm a terrible poker player. I can't time interpretation. Sometimes I look at my watch to time the interpretation, so it doesn't seem to work for me, and I, people don't like you to look at your watch. Uh, and uh, then I, uh, I try so hard to, uh, uh, to be tactful. And, but my patients see my face moving around. They want to know what I think. So before I know it, I've blurted it all out. And I've said, well, you know, uh, Carl Jung has a theory about this sort of thing. And based on what you've just told me, all the interest you've been showing ever since you walked in the room with the feelings of just about everybody else but yourself and uh, I mean, just about every hour is spent telling me um, about what's happening to one of your friends or to your college roommate or how uh, uh, Susie's marriage is going or uh, uh, how that party's going to be handled. I just have to tell you that you concern yourself an awful lot uh, with other people's feelings, and that's what Jung calls an extroverted feeling type. And I just have that feeling that that's you. And um, I want you to know that that's something that you really love to do. Uh, that's how you use your time here. And I haven't noticed you uh, bringing up anything about Immanuel Kant in a long time, so I don't think thinking is a strong thing for you, and I don't think you should expect it to be. So I've just given the ranch away, I suppose. And, but I feel that um, if I really know something, uh, it helps people to hear what I think and what I see, and I try to create a spirit of inquiry where uh, each of us can contribute what he thinks he knows, or he or she knows, and um, it's all open to argument and debate, and we can go back around it. But I have to say that it becomes a kind of language, maybe it's because I like to teach, I end up teaching a little bit of it, and then most of my patients get better at it than I am. I mean, we can talk about all these things indefinitely. There is that moment when a person just knows who they are or it isn't. And until that time, it really is just tentative talk. But at that moment, it's the realest thing in the world. And sometimes it's very humi hum humiliating to me because someone who I've just laid a trip on and told them they were a certain kind of type, the moment when it happens and they know who they are, they just come back and it's clear as a bell and they'll tell me who they are. And it isn't, I, a lot of times introverted intuitives turn out later on to be introverted feeling types. I remember one man who was so sure he was a thinking type and uh, this time I unmasked him. I, I recognized that he had, uh, 
he had a strong feeling function. And uh, he dreamt he was in his grandmother's house and uh, he was washing a blue wall and the paint started coming off and underneath it, the wall was red. Well, anyone who knows type knows that blue is the traditional color associated with thinking and red with feelings, so the blue wall was apparently a facade. And uh, the dream helped us. Now, as it turned out, feeling I don't think was his superior function. I think it was his auxiliary function, so it wasn't as simple as getting it. But it was certainly clear that uh, one of his leading functions was not thinking at all, but feeling. Why his grandmother's house? Well, his grandmother had put a high premium on education. She had practically raised him. And he had saved himself by getting a very good education. And everyone had been very proud of his grades in school. So he had been uh, pleasing his grandmother by putting up a kind of uh, thinking facade. But underneath it was a more basic feeling nature. I've, uh, I've met a number of men who felt overshadowed by their fathers or brothers and felt bad about themselves. I remember one uh, extroverted, intuitive man who uh, uh, came from a sensation family. And I thought he was uh, an introverted sensation type because he was engaged in uh, uh, activities. Uh, he worked around machines and he was doing things that involved sensation. And uh, except the trouble was he was doing it terribly and he was often uh, losing his job. And I didn't quite catch on for the longest time. He was a bright fellow. I just thought he was uh, unadapted or primitive or whatever. Finally, it all came out. He was an extroverted intuitive, just like me. And uh, extroverted sensation father and sensation type brother. And uh, I think the whole family had been uh, uh, sensation types and some kind of sensation type business uh, that uh, he was trying to follow. And it was all wrong for him. He was the, uh, so he was, he was treated sort of like the, um, the identified patient, we say, in, in, a, in a family, or so the new, it's the new uh, therapist version of black sheep in a family. He was sort of the psychological black sheep in his family, and uh, he walked around uh, uh, failing for all the rest of them, because uh, for them to get into intuition at all was to be a failure. So. We had a lot of work to do, and I, I still remember uh, our discovery of his type followed a dream in which uh, uh, he had uh, gone somewhere where he felt at home and could be himself. And right after that dream, he, he, uh, he told me what his type was and that I had been wrong to uh, think he was sensation-oriented. What's the connection between colors and types? C.A. Meyer says that the type code is absolute. You can find it in um, two of Jung's essays. One is a study uh, in the process of individuation, and the other is um, concerning mandala symbolism. And there, somewhere in the text, or in one case, I think even in the footnotes, you find this color code. And the color code, as I, as I said before, is uh, red for feeling, blue for thinking, green or brown for sensation, and yellow for intuition. Uh, is this absolute? Uh, I rather like it. It does seem to uh, work more of the time than not. I particularly like it when bad colors come up in dreams. For instance, a bad yellow. Uh, that always uh, suggests to me that we're dealing with an inferior intuition rather than a superior. I suppose both number and color ref refer to extremely primal experiences since uh, 
we all have the experience of numbers of things and we all have the experience of colors and uh, we're dealing he here with extremely archetypal realities um, the association of uh, um, color with psychological type is a very, very puzzling thing. It seems to say that um, the types are not only particular, but they're extremely peculiar. They have extremely peculiar natures. Um, obviously, a red shirt is not a yellow shirt. The, the character of the shirt is different, and a, a red wall is not a blue wall. And it seems to me that uh, when we use color symbolism to indicate type, uh, there's an attempt to um, uh, emphasize um, the style of the consciousness, that the consciousness has a certain style and has a certain uh, overall uh, impact and effect. Well, the question comes up about the inferior function, and I always feel that anyone who wants to learn Jungian psychology ought to get hold of that book published by Spring Publications called Lectures on Jung's Typology. And it's really two lectures on Jung's Typology, one by uh, Marie-Louise von Franz called uh, The Inferior Function, and the other uh, by James Hillman called The Feeling Function. Not really two lectures, two series of lectures. These were originally given as series of lectures at the Jung Institute in Zurich. But uh, the book is in two parts. And uh, von Franz uh, gives us uh, a dazzling uh, discussion of this part of the psyche Jung called the inferior function. The superior function and the inferior function are two points along a human line. And that human line is the plumb line of the personality, which I call the spine. And I like to think of the superior function as the head of the spine, and the inferior function as the tail of the spine. And this definition of the spine is a very real thing. I, I had that when I discovered that I was an intuitive type. I mean, I just knew suddenly that the, the man who dreamed when he was depressed uh, had to be some kind of intuitive. And I later realized it was an extroverted intuitive, and he also had to be an absent-minded bloke who lost things, and that was my inferior introverted sensation. And I felt my spine in that. And um, not long after that, I dreamt that I was uh, present at the birth of a baby, and I was both uh, uh, the person giving the birth and uh, I was also uh, the person uh, delivering the baby. And I, if I really knew it, I was also the baby. I mean, the baby, which was coming out of that healthy sense of spine, was my sense of my, my nature, my psychological type. That sense of selfhood that we all have is along that mysterious axis between what we're best at and what we're worst at which is the spine of our personality. And there is our uprightness. There is our integrity. Now, another way of saying this, metaphorically and, and analogically, is uh, that a personality needs to drop anchor. Some people are pretty clear about what they're best at. But it doesn't ground them enough. What grounds them is that thing they're not so good at. The thing they can't control with the conscious mind, the thing they can't make money at, the thing they can't will, the thing they can't push around, the thing that just is and constantly brings them down to earth. I was in my glory just a few days ago at the time of the election because I consulted the I Ching last January, uh, January of uh, 1992, and I asked about some presidential possibilities. And based on the answers I got, I concluded that Clinton could win the election and that Bush would lose the election. And uh, 
because I can't contain anything. I let that out at a public lecture in April or so, and uh, then I just lived in dread because uh, if that didn't come through, my name would be mud. And uh, it was a very strange political year, and there were many vicissitudes. And when Clinton finally won and uh, Bush lost, I was the prophet of all time. I was just exactly what I wanted to be, great extroverted, intuitive prophet. And I was so uh, filled with my happiness and my glory and my rightness and all the rest that I forgot to write down uh, the time of two of my patients and uh, uh, managed to uh, ignore the uh, writing in my calendar on a third, so I messed up three appointments in a single week. I mean, it was just, it, and so uh, what a nerd this, uh, this uh, would-be genius turned out to be. And that's the way of the balancing act that the psyche gives us every single time between our marvelous extroverted intuition in my case and my absolutely rotten, no good uh, uh, introverted sensation that uh, can't be trusted. Or one could look at it the other way. One could say, what's rotten is my inflated extroverted intuition and what's good about me is this humble introverted sensation that makes these mistakes to remind me that I need to pay attention to the here and now and the straight and narrow and to be humble. Now, the humility of that thing that I've had a lifelong inferiority complex about um, didn't come through to me till I finally had a dream in which the introverted sensation was directly symbolized. And interestingly enough, um, by a figure of the opposite sex, of a lower social class, and another race, but a person of great human value. My Chinese laundress, at a time when I was taking my uh, clothes to be washed at a one of the many Chinese laundries that are available in the city where for almost as much as it would cost to, uh, or not much more than it would cost to do it oneself, one actually can leave the laundry and have it all neatly folded and so forth. And in my uh, early days as a, as a young doctor in this city, I thought it was the height of glory to uh, have this done for me. So I always dropped off my laundry at the, at the laundrette. And uh, in my dream, the Chinese laundress appeared, and she was cleaning up around the bathroom, and then she was by herself in her room. And she was extremely poor. She didn't have anything, and she looked unhappy. Mm -hmm. The room was kind of stark and empty. And why didn't she have anything? Well, she had a husband who was out um, spending his money, gambling, drinking, maybe doping, out all hours, and didn't bring anything home to her. Well, this was some anima figure. I had expected, reading Jungian psychology, that I was going to get a marvelous uh, movie actress or some woman whose face shone like the sun or some really extraordinary woman who would tell me poetry or appear in a toga or something. And it was my Chinese laundress. Now, granted, I'd had some of those women, but they never had time for me. They were all filled with themselves and narcissistic, so they weren't doing anything for me. This woman was taking care of me, but no one was taking care of her. Well, now, what did that mean? What did that mean? Well, it wasn't hard to get her type. This was the woman that I could identify pretty clearly as an introverted sensation type. Uh, she was uh, efficient, good with her hands, good with menial things, uh, didn't concern herself with a lot of uh, 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 in 
intuitive possibilities. Didn't have particularly good thinking or good feeling, but very, very good sensation. Uh, worked behind the scenes. Uh, well, what was my introverted sensation like in those days? Well, I didn't give my body too much. I used to have headaches. Um, I uh, didn't notice what I ate. And I don't think I ate particularly well in those days. Um, didn't get enough sleep. The husband that was off gambling, drinking, doping, spending the money. Well, I did spend too much money. I, uh, I've already told you that by saying that I'd rather than be efficient and buy a washing machine or do it myself, I was having it done. And I wasn't counting the pennies that that added up to quite a few pennies, if you really think about it. It seemed logical to me at the time. But uh, it was a very expensive way to take care of laundry. I'm happy to say I wasn't a drinker or a doper. Um, but I was all over town chasing possibilities. I was the original person that if I would read late at night after a day of work that a book had just been released, I had to be at the bookstore to chase down that possibility. Or if a new movie was there, I had to go out and see it, even if I was tired, and even if it meant I'd be tired the next day. I just couldn't let a possibility go. That's a typical extroverted intuitive thing. So according to the unconscious, they were married. The introverted sensation woman and the man running all over town were married. So that's as if to say, that the introverted sensation and the extroverted intuition are related to each other. And that's where you get the idea of the spine again. In other words, there are, there are two ends of an axis. There are two, there are two parts of a marriage. And um, the point is, he wasn't taking care of her. They were going their separate ways. And I began to understand what this, this dream was saying. So I, be, I began to look at this. How was I not taking care of introverted sensation? Well, I started by watching what was happening. I was already in practice by now. I started looking at what was going on in my practice. Would you know that I didn't even breathe in those days in the analytic hours, or not nearly enough? I would sit while a person told me a dream with bated breath, waiting to hear what the next symbolic image would be, and the one after that, and the one after that. My mind would run off, and, and I was a good student, and I would listen to these images and tick off possibilities for archetypal amplification or possible meanings in the person's life and make connections with this and that. And I completely forgot about myself. I was so busy chasing down the possibilities in this other person's unconscious life, I would forget that I was there. I would forget to breathe. I would forget that I was uncomfortable. I could, I could sit so hard that I would make one of my feet go to sleep that I, by pressing it so hard against the other, just with this intensity of, of interest in someone else chasing down the possibilities in other people's psyche. Granted, I learned a lot of psychology that way, but at what cost to myself? So I learned that someone could tell you something, and whether they liked it or not, you could breathe. I could breathe, you see. I could... How, does, how, do, how do I feel right now, let alone how they feel, what they're, what they're talking about? What, where, where am I? 
Am I comfortable? Is there enough ambient air? Is it too hot? Did I breathe? Let me adjust myself, get into my body. And then I would notice that my body had been miserable the whole time they'd been talking. And that was a better clue to what was going on than all the intuitive possibilities in their dream imagery. And then I could even dare to say, you know, it's funny, I haven't been all that comfortable since you started talking. In fact, I've been feeling kind of constricted and unhappy, and I noticed I had a little bit of a headache starting. I wonder if that's important, too. And the person would burst into tears. And all the affect that had been suppressed behind the dream, which was being used as a defensive structure, as a, as a way of talking about their problem but not really owning it, talking about it through the dream, the defense would dissolve and the person would come into view and my body had felt it. Not my good intuitive mind. So I began to learn that therapy is better done often through the inferior function and through the superior function. Anyway, what do you think happened in my dream life? Uh, she looked better now. She looked happier. Her husband was taking her out for ice cream. Can we identify a particular archetype with a particular psychological type function? And if we do, will that change over time? Well, of course, one of the things I've pioneered is the idea that um, all of the psychological types in a given individual are carried by archetypes. Specifically, they're carried by part personalities of the total psyche. And that one can actually identify a human personality with each of the eight types that makes up the completeness of one's uh, type profile. So, um, uh, I've already said that the superior function has the character of a hero. And I've said that in a man, the inferior function has uh, the uh, character of the anima the anima being a, a figure of the opposite sex. Uh, the figure of the opposite sex with a certain strangeness associated to it. When we're talking about um, uh, archetypes carrying the functions, I pretty much confine myself not to impersonal geometric patterns like mandalas, but to human archetypes. And um, I believe that the uh, archetype carrying the superior function is the hero archetype. Uh, often in a woman, the heroine. Often in a man, the hero. This was uh, a relatively easy uh, uh, identification to make. When I started with this work, the only identification that had been made with an archetypal figure and a type was the inferior function. Jung had said somewhere that the anima carries the inferior function in a man and that the animus carries the inferior function in a woman. And there he pretty much left, let it rest. Um, I said, well, why can't the superior function have an arch archetype too, and I. The more I thought about it, the more I thought that my extroverted intuition was my hero, and uh, uh, it has a certain uh, 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 larger than life quality, an ability to do unusual things well, uh, and uh, is the part of me that's capable of. Uh, significant innovation. It's also the part of me that's capable of inflation in the sense of uh, being so good that uh, it thinks it's too good. Uh, and uh, it has a tendency to work alone and to think of itself as a law unto itself. And it loves to, to not only cope with situations and solve problems and uh, uh, 
pass the kind of hero tests that the hero uh, passes in a fairy tale, but um, to um, rise to occasions and to uh, master situations. John, tell us about your books. I should really start with my first book, which was a book that I did right after I finished my residency called Psychiatric Treatment, Crisis Clinic and Consultation. And um, there's a chapter on psychotic states in it that I wrote, which uh, implicitly uh, uh, shows uh, shadow sides of uh, the various uh, psychological types. So uh, this was published in 1975 by McGraw-Hill. The next uh, book I did came out just after I became a Jungian analyst. There seemed to be a fate that I would uh, become a psychiatrist and then immediately after I have to write a book on psychiatric treatment. Here I had to edit a whole book of Congress papers for uh, the first Congress that I attended after I became a uh, Jungian analyst in 1980, and it has this wonderful title, Money, Food, Drink, and Fashion, and Analytic Training. Then, um, about uh, three years ago, in 1989, I got a chance to uh, edit a book of Jung's papers on masculine psychology and to write a foreword to it. And, uh, This was a wonderful opportunity, and uh, I enjoyed putting these together. I made my own selection. He doesn't have any one paper that's uh, about masculine psychology the way some of his papers are about feminine psychology. There's no single place where he talks about the animus over the course of a single paper, for example, let alone the parts of a, of a man's psyche. So I had to pick and choose, and I I made a selection that, uh, in one relatively short volume, that wouldn't be longer than Aspects of the Feminine, which had already been published. It's very important to keep this equal. And uh, Princeton University Press brought, brought this out, and it's still, uh, still doing very well. The cover shows uh, the strange spirit Mercurius, which is uh, Jung's ultimate image of the, uh, of the masculine. And then finally, if you've edited enough books and contributed chapters to enough, sooner or later people say, John, will you ever write a book of your own? And, and uh, I always thought my first book would be about types, but I got a chance to give some lectures in uh, Texas in uh, 1991, and I took it, and uh, I gave lectures on the subject that had become rather important to me, the subject of integrity. And uh, This book is called Integrity in Depth, and uh, typology figures in it as an aspect of our integrity. Uh, I actually record uh, the experience of a woman patient coming to terms with her own spine. But my real goal in this book was uh, to discuss integrity as nearly as I can tell for the first time in such, a, such an extended presentation as a psychological concept rather than just as a moral concept. Believe. We've always been taught that integrity is standing up for what you believe and keeping your agreements and being principled in your behavior. And what I say in this book is that integrity is essentially a willing sensitivity to the needs of the whole. And it's not enough just to defend uh, one's particular part, but that one has to take into account the whole. So uh, this is a, a, a book that gives a sort of overarching philosophical statement to what I hope to follow up with a much more practical book on the psychological types, which is sort of integrity in practice when you take responsibility
for the functioning of all of these eight intelligences within yourself and, and admit that they're all part of you rather than splitting them into those that you like and those that you don't like and, uh, and uh, disowning uh, uh, the fact that you're always, always acting and behaving and that there's a whole world for which you have to take uh, your rightful share of responsibility. That seems to me really what integrity is. Um, I'm also uh, an editor, as I mentioned at the beginning. I founded this journal, the San Francisco Young Institute Library Journal, uh, in 1979. And um, uh, these days we are a very upstanding publication with about 2,000 subscribers internationally. And we come out on time four times a year. And, we are just about self-sufficient. And uh, this is a journal exclusively devoted to reviews of Jungian books and articles and uh, uh, that uh, can be construed as reviews. Some of them are rather long, extensive essays that take off from the review. Um, sometimes it takes a long time for us to get around to reviewing a particular author's works or a set of works, but eventually uh, everyone gets covered and covered in depth, and that's our, that's our goal. And um, I've been asked uh, recently, within the last couple of years, to uh, uh, be part of the Journal of Analytical Psychology. I'm now the American co-editor. There's an English co-editor also. And this comes out four times a year. This is the uh, gold standard of uh, Jungian journals. And uh, it's a great honor to be part of it. And uh, um, it gives me a lot to uh, do to edit these journals. But it gives me so much back because it enables me to keep track of what's going on in this ever-changing and busy field. And, no one can possibly cover the whole of it, but, it, but I get an awfully good cross-section between these two journals. I spend an awful lot of time reading manuscripts and going over them, um, and I sometimes worry that it takes away from my own chance to write and work. But on the other hand, uh, it's a very good discipline, and uh, I, uh, I don't think I'd trade it. Thank you, John, for being with us.